One day, me and my family went to a river which was not too far away from our house. When we arrived there, I immediately felt something was strange. So I got out of the car, and there was a very bad smell coming from the bushes. I didn't think much of it at first. However, when I was about to go back to the car, then I saw a bloody knife. It looked pretty new one, but I know that I didn't see it before though. I just thought something was catching a fish around there. After returning home, I heard on the news that a dead body was found near the same river we visited. And surprisingly, the victim was one of my dad's friends. That night, I had a nightmare while I was sleeping. I saw a man killing the other man and hiding it in the bushes next to the river. Then he came to me in the nightmare with a bloody, creepy smile on his face and asked me, Kid, why didn't you check the bushes? My body froze and I couldn't speak at all. He continued saying, I want him to be dead. I want him in jail. I want him in hell. I had kids. That was the moment when I woke up and the time was about 4.30 a.m. Even though I woke up from that dream, I could remember his face clearly. Anyway, I didn't tell anybody about my dream after that. Until this day, the killer was not found yet. It happened in December 2018. I've been running a pizza store for a long time in a small neighborhood. I got an order call around 12 p.m., which came from an apartment building B, number 201, which was located in a remote area. It was almost the closing time of the hmm. store, so I was sure there will be no more orders. And to save about $5 for the delivery fees, I decided to deliver it myself. When I rode my motorcycle following the mobile phone navigation, I saw apartment A written on a fairly old wall, so I thought the building next to it would be building B. So I stopped my motorcycle nearby and went into it. Since the building was so old and unmanaged, the numbers on the doors were worn out, and all the sensors did not light up while I was going up the stairs. However, I know that many old apartments are often out of light, so without thinking about it, I just turned on my cell phone flashlight and continued going up the stairs. There was an amulet attached to room 201. And reading those Chinese characters, hmm. it wasn't that important meaning. And I checked the number to see if the number was correct, knocked lightly on the door, and heard a woman's answer. And I heard the sound of people standing up. Then the footsteps entered somewhere from the living room. I felt like I could hear the floor creaking well when she walked, maybe because it was an old apartment. Hmm. They don't have to look for the wallet because they paid in advance. I was wondering at first, but decided to wait a little longer, just in case something happened inside. So I waited in the dark for three more minutes, but there was no sign of people coming out. I knocked again and rang the doorbell, but after that, no answer was heard from the house. And beyond the door and upstairs, I could hear laughter from some kind of entertainment programs on TV. I waited to see if the person inside went to the bathroom and knocked again, but no one didn't answer. I couldn't wait any longer, so I called the number I got. Fortunately, the phone was connected quickly. Pizza delivery, please open the door. It seemed that the person who had ordered wanted to give her children at home for a late night snack while working overtime at work. I'm working outside right now. Our apartment is divided into A, B section and A2, B2 section. I think you went to the wrong apartment. People often get confused. The A2 and B2 buildings will be demolished soon so no one lives there right now. When I heard that no one lives in building A2 and B2, the TV sound heard beyond the door and upstairs suddenly stopped. When I see other scary stories, usually the TV sound would have become louder or something would have run down from upstairs, but I just could feel the cold coming up my ankle at the same time as the sound was cut off. 
I said okay and hung up the phone and came down the stairs with a flashlight on my cell phone. It was only the second floor, but the cold came up to my back neck as I was going down and, surprisingly, disappeared as soon as I came outside. When I came outside and looked up, all the lights in the building were turned off. I mean, the lights of 201 and 301 were literally turned on at first. I wanted to go back right away, but I had to complete the delivery anyway, so I walked around the building for a long time and finally found Building B. The apartment's lobby was lit up and seemed that people were living it there. And when I knocked on the door at 201, a grandmother and two children opened the door right away and took the pizza. Because I left my motorcycle there, I had to pass in front of Building A2 again. But there was only silence, as if nothing had happened. What were the answers, TV, and laughter that I heard in Building A2? Sometimes I get goosebumps when I think of that day, even now. This is what my aunt actually went through. My aunt, who lived alone at the time, came home from her morning appointment and suddenly heard a rattling sound in the kitchen. The sound was too loud, so thinking that a burglar had entered, she immediately took out the golf club from the shoe closet and headed quietly to the kitchen. She then saw a draining board that put the plates and a cabinet on the sink, but there was something else. An old lady with a black face was hanging from a cabinet and smiling. Not just a normal smile, but she was shaking the cabinet as if she were like mad. My aunt was so surprised at the moment that she just stared at the old lady with her mouth open. Then she ran to the living room to call the police, thinking that a stranger had broken in. Suddenly, there was a loud noise in the kitchen. When she went back to the kitchen to see what's happening, both the cabinet and the draining board were collapsed, and the old lady vanished into thin air. However, the story doesn't end here. A few days later, there was an incident that an old lady who lived in the next apartment hung herself on a drying rack while suffering from depression. My aunt eventually moved out after that. This happened to me not too long ago. One day, I was so tired that I couldn't even think of turning off the light and fell asleep. And I ended up getting sleep paralysis. Suddenly, the light started flickering as it turned off and on. I wondered what was going on, but soon decided not to open my eyes because I was scared for some reason. However, the speed of flickering began to increase and I couldn't resist the curiosity, so I finally opened my eyes. And in front of me, I could see a woman staring at my face, tilting her head on both sides. As her face tilted, the light was hidden from my view and repeatedly seen again. The moment I bumped into her eyes, I fainted. And it was morning when I opened my eyes again. It's been about 10 years. I was in my early 20s and I went on a trip to the countryside with my girlfriend for vacation at that time. I don't remember exactly how many days we went around, but what I experienced at the motel on the first day is still memorable. My girlfriend and I arrived at the bus terminal without any plans. The sun was going down already and we were tired, so we decided to stay at a motel near the terminal as soon as we got off the bus. I think the problem was that we entered anywhere nearby without considering the location. After having a good time with my girlfriend, I fell asleep deeply, and suddenly my eyes opened for no reason. For your information, I tend to fall asleep very deeply when I fall asleep, so I don't wake up unless someone shakes me. But my girlfriend, who was sleeping next to me, tossed and turned, and I ended up waking up slightly because of her movement. 
I opened my eyes slightly and watched my girlfriend turn around by the bed and go to the bathroom. And at that moment, I saw a black shadow following her. It wasn't a shadow of my girlfriend, but it was a black shadow with hands and feet moving separately. No eyes, no nose, no mouth, but it was just like a human being. I didn't believe in ghosts and strange phenomenon without scientific evidence, but I definitely thought something was wrong. When I woke up, I jumped out of bed and ran to the bathroom where my girlfriend went in. I tried to open it, but the door wasn't open. And then I heard a middle-aged man laughing inside. I remember clearly because I wasn't drunk and I was already awake, certainly. Turning the locked door handle, I shouted my girlfriend's name. Babe, open the door. But no sound was heard from the inside and the door was not open. I still can't remember whether the next scene is a dream or a reality. When I pushed the door with my shoulder, the door finally opened. But she was not there and the bathroom was empty. I thought for a long time about what happened and came back to bed in order to get back my senses. I almost fainted when I saw it. My girlfriend was standing on the bed, smiling fiercely at me. I've been dating her for almost two years, but I've never seen that creepy smile before. I don't remember exactly whether she opened her eyes or not. I just grabbed her by the shoulder and shook her, but she slipped back to sleep. I couldn't fall asleep that day, and I waited until dawn with my open eyes. I woke my girlfriend up as soon as the morning came and escaped from the motel hurriedly. When I went out of the motel and asked her if she remembered what happened yesterday, but she didn't seem to know anything. I didn't say anything to her either because I thought she'd be scared if I told her about it in detail. This is all my story. But now, 10 years later, I suddenly remembered this incident and searched the motel. And turns out there have been several murders and suicides over the decades. The media didn't put the name of the place directly, but I'm sure that the place is right after reading several reviews of the accommodation. Of course, I still don't believe in psychic phenomena. But after that day, I stopped going to the motel again. My name is Hazel, and I live in Canada. I am 26 years old now, but this happened to me 13 years ago. Whenever my mom goes to markets to buy some groceries, she would always get me toys from around there, since I really loved dolls a lot that time. One day, she went to a toy store with me, as usual. When mom entered the store, she realized that the store was in bad condition. The wallpaper on the wall was green and really dirty, and the lights were dull and flickering. But I didn't care, as I was so excited that I didn't even notice the condition of the store. There was a shopkeeper, and Mom told me to stay right next to her and choose a doll quickly. I was confused, but soon agreed, and after I finally picked a doll, we went to the counter to purchase it. When she was taking the money out of her bag, then I noticed the shopkeeper was glancing at me with a weird look. His face looked like he didn't wash it, and his outfit was a black shirt with stains on it. Being scared, I grabbed my mom's sweater tight. I don't remember much, but when I was about to leave the store, I was behind my mom. And as I was about to step out of the store, I felt like something touched me on my back roughly. As soon as I looked back, I saw that shopkeeper was looking at me. Screaming, I ran towards my mom and hid behind her. She also knew something was wrong, so she ran out of that place to avoid him. However, he even got out of the store and started following us to the market. Mom ended up deciding to call the cops as I got too scared of him. When the cops finally arrived, we explained them everything. They went to that market searching for the toy store and eventually caught him near the store. 
after investigating him, they informed us that they found out he has killed more than 17 innocent children who came to the store without their parents. When we heard from them, we were so scared that we were about to fall down. What would happen if I didn't run to my mom at that time? I would have been the next kid to die. My name is Adam, and I was about 17 years old when this incident happened. So, back in 2015, two of my friends and I went to Disneyland in California. We were there until 11 p.m., and all of us were too tired to drive home in my friend Jay's minivan. So, we ended up staying at a hotel. However, our budget was kind of tight to stay at a nice hotel. So, we settled at a small two-story brown hotel. As soon as we walked in, it was very dark inside, and I could see the front desk light was on. The short guy at the front desk seemed to be in his 30s and had a very friendly smile. He said to us that we were the only customers he had seen all day, and then we paid him $30 for the room. We could choose any room we wanted since there were no other people staying there, so we picked room 7 on the second floor. When we walked into the room, Jay jumped on the bed and fell asleep right away. There was one bed and a couch left, so we argued over who was going to have a bed. Rudy was especially scared about the Yelp app review that lots of people heard large rats in the vents. So I ended up lying on a large, stiff red couch right above this large vent. The vent was large enough and it was close enough to the ground to crawl in there. I was joking with Rudy that the rats are going to come through the vent and eat him alive. And this made him on edge, but he finally fell asleep. Around 1 a.m. when I finally went to sleep, I suddenly awoke to a bump sound in the vent. I looked around the room to see if all the suitcases were open, but both Jay and Rudy were asleep. So I was pretty spooked out at that time. No rat could do this. I thought to myself. Just then, something caught my eyes, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The man's face was staring at me through the vent. I quickly grabbed my phone and turned the flashlight on to see the man's whole face. He had a few teeth missing and strands of hair had fallen out from the side of his head. He then slowly opened the vent and said like this, Please! Don't scream. She won't like it. I yelled, and Jay and Rudy both awoke in fear. And just then, the man got out and tried to grab me as all of them ran out of the room. We all ran down to the front desk and called the police. A few minutes later, the police arrived. When they entered the room, no one was there, so they decided to check inside the vents. To my surprise, they found him in the corner of the vent with blankets and food as if he'd been living in there for a long time. They ended up pulling him out and arrested him. For a week, I was still in shock from what had happened. But the other day in the morning, one of the officers called me and told me about him. He escaped from the mental hospital four months ago and murdered his mother and grandmother. It is said that the bodies had been badly dismembered. He also had a kitchen knife in his pocket when they arrested him. They sent him back to the county jail, and I heard nothing else from the officer after that. To this day, I still wonder what would have happened to me and my friends if I just ignored the sound from the vent that night. I was 14 years old at the time when this happened. Where I lived was right next to the forest, and of course, the children weren't supposed to go inside. <laughs> However, me and my friends usually would sneak in to play hide-and-seek. That day was peaceful and calm, as usual. As if nothing could go wrong. I'm going to cut to the chase for those of you who are curious. It was March 13th, and I had just gotten back from school to play in the woods. However, me and a few of my friends in our neighborhood decided to find a different route. As a result, 
as we got further in, we started to get lost. When we started to look around for the way to go back, we found an axe lodged in the tree with blood handprints on its handle. Furthermore, we then found a dead body lying in the creek as we passed by, which led us to panic. To our surprise, the body was of the guard in our neighborhood, who usually looked around for teenagers who were sneaking out after curfew. It was horrible to see that his back was wide ripped. Being scared of the dead body, Charles, one of my friends, urged us to go on a different path and ended up going on his way with another friend, Luke. While we were going around in circles, we suddenly heard Luke's scream. Then I saw him running back towards us as three bullets pierced the air and shot him in the back and the head. Then a man came out from the shadows with Charles' body in his hand. I could see him munching on the insides of his brain. Terrified, the rest of us started to run as fast as we could, not even daring to look back. Just then, another friend, Jamie, who was running beside me, got caught in a net trap. I stopped and tried untying the net to free him. However, I had no choice but to run when I saw the man coming towards me. The other friends had already run further than I had, so I was on my own eventually. From nowhere, something hit my head and I could realize that it was Jamie's foot. I ran away from there like an arrow, finally came back to the neighborhood and went into my house. After I told my parents about the whole story, my mom called the police and they came to arrest the man in the forest. Fortunately, he was found in the forest and arrested immediately. It turned out that he was a cannibal and strongly obsessed with the Silence of the Lambs movies. And he was a beef supplier for lots of fast food restaurants. He was finally sentenced to death for murdering a large number of people in the last 10 years. From this horrible experience, I ended up becoming a vegan and never eat any kind of meat again. I was attacked by a monster in a lake. I won't tell you the country and area I live in. When I was 21, my friends and I decided to check out the big lake nearby. The three of us got to the lake. It was a beautiful sight. This lake is not that popular since it's not a famous tourist site. Naturally, the lake has not seen that many visitors. We decided to fish there. It's originally banned to fish there, but we thought we wouldn't get caught anyways. We settled down with our fishing rods. We caught much fish, continuing to catch one big fish after another. Meanwhile, I could feel something strong tugging my rod. This is a gigantic fish, I thought, pulling with all my might, but it wouldn't come out of the water, so I thought my rod was stuck under a rock. It wouldn't even budge, so I thought, damn, it got stuck under a rock and tried to shake the rod left and right to get it out of there. It was that moment. Suddenly, an enormous force sucked my rod in and ended up falling into the water from the strength. It happened so fast that I couldn't even let go. All my friends laughed at me after I fell into the water but the fishing rod was sucked into the water in the blink of an eye. All of us were surprised by that. It was as if a giant fish with great strength, maybe like a shark, was living in this lake. I was frightened and tried to swim my way out. And at that moment, I stepped on something big. It was not the ground, it was moving. I could instinctively feel from the touch it was a giant being. 
but there can't be a giant fish like a shark in a lake. I was absolutely terrified, and I swam toward the land to get out of the water. My friends also shouted to come quickly, and I saw their faces were suddenly seized with fear. I witnessed a massive shadow over the water in front of me. A gigantic monster jumped out of the water right in front of me. It was a monster, not a fish. How should I describe it? I didn't get to give a good look during that urgent situation. But the feeling that I got at that brief moment was that it looked like a dinosaur. It didn't eat me, fortunately. I frantically swam out of the water, and when I stepped on the land, it tried to attack me from my back, but I managed to kick it at its mouth. It went back into the water after that. Even at a glance, it was gigantic, like the size of a whale. I barely stepped onto the land and fell to the ground with my friends shrieking. I couldn't feel my legs, and my whole body was shaking. I saw the giant shadow slowly disappearing into the water. My friends and I stared at the water for a while. Then, we immediately packed and drove back home at a high speed. We reported it to the police, but they thought we were pulling a prank. The lake was too big and deep, so it would be difficult to properly search for it too. Since that day, we never even went back near that lake ever again. I was traumatized from the incident and quit doing the thing I used to love, fishing. I can't even go into the water anymore. What was that I saw back then? Was it just a gigantic fish, or was it some other life form that we don't know of? I still cannot forget the fear of that day. This happened back in 2012 when I was still attending college. Me and a few friends of mine opted to band together and rent out a one-bedroom apartment near the campus. We were a bunch of party animals back then, and we wanted our own place, so we could indulge in that lifestyle without worrying about our parents or the school's administration. The apartment complex was located in a rather unsavory part of town. The cops were called out there at least once a week to break up fights or to respond to reports of break-ins. All we ever did there was shower and sleep. Having to overhear domestic disputes and arguing through the walls was just part of the deal. One night my roommates went to a party while I stayed behind to study for an upcoming exam. Aside from some Tupac playing somewhere in the upper levels, things were pretty quiet. It was around 11pm when I heard a strange sound coming from the hallway outside the front door. It sounded like a large metal object being dragged across the concrete floor. There was also a muffled noise, like someone was saying something, although I couldn't quite make out any words. This went on for about 10 minutes, before there came a loud smashing sound. It was at this point that I got up and made my way over to the peephole. At first I didn't see anything so I just waited to see if anyone would pass by my door. About a minute later, a figure came into view and stood between my door and the door opposite. It was a Caucasian male. Now I will list three things that instantly made every alarm bell in my head go off. The man wasn't wearing a shirt and was completely drenched in sweat. There was a large axe in the man's right hand that he was dragging behind him. And last but not least, this deranged individual had on a black leather gas mask that completely hid his face. I was awestruck. This is the kind of thing that you see in low-budget horror movies. This kind of shit doesn't happen in real life. It was a complete shock to the system. As if reading my mind, a creepy, muffled voice then began singing. Come with me, Hail Mary, run quick, see. What do we have here now? Do you want to ride or die? La da da da, la 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 la. As soon as the man finished the verse, he lifted his left leg 
and heaved the axe into my door. The movement was so fast, it caused me to topple backward. As soon as I scrambled to my feet, I heard another voice from further down the hallway. Hey, what the fuck are you doing? I rushed back to the peephole. The masked man was now gone. To the left of my front door was a fire escape, where he was able to make a quick getaway. I then saw the apartment security guard step into view with his taser drawn. Hey, do you want me to call the police? I shouted through the door. Yeah, if you don't mind. I'm going back outside to cut him off. I immediately called the police and explained the situation to them. Unfortunately, the masked man managed to evade both the security guard and the police. The complex was surrounded by a small forest, and there was just too many ways for him to escape. After the lease was up, I moved out of that hellhole. A lunatic pacing up and down the hallway outside my door, wearing a gas mask and dragging an axe behind him while singing a creepy-ass rendition of a Tupac song was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was a terrifying experience, but I can look back on it now and laugh. I hope you've enjoyed my story, and stay safe out there, guys. This happened with me when I was 10 years old. Every evening around 6 o'clock, my friends and I would play in the park near our building. This was our everyday routine, and I was the one who called everyone to play. I would knock at each of my five friends' apartments. It was not much work as we lived in the same apartment building. One time, I went to call my friend. We will call her Abby for now. Abby and I were very close, and we loved sharing everything with each other. Lately, Abby had been having nightmares. When she would wake up, she would not remember the nightmares. This was odd, I know, but Abby didn't like talking about it, so I didn't ask her many questions. I knocked on Abby's door. She opened the door and had a scared look on her face. I asked her if something was wrong, and she just said that she had another nightmare when she took a nap. Curious, I asked her if she remembered it, and surprisingly, this time she did. She told me that she had dreamt of a woman with a hammer in her hand, staring at her, looking right into her eyes. The woman had a creepy smirk on her face with blood on her white dress. The hammer was pointed at Abby, and the woman was standing in a park with swings and flowers. Abby then started crying and said that she didn't like having nightmares and that she wanted to change the situation. I comforted Abby and asked her to come play as it would distract her for a while. I also asked her to tell this to her parents, but Abby said it probably wasn't a big deal and that she's fine. We went to the park and played games, played on the swings and the slides. It was around 7 and it was dark, so Abby, my other friends and I decided to leave the park. As we were walking towards the exit, a woman in a white dress appeared in front of us. She had a smirk on her face, which discomforted me, and the worst part? She was carrying a hammer, and her dress was covered in blood. My friends and I stood there in shock and fear. Abby looked at me. It was the lady from her dream. She was here. Abby's dream was not a dream. It was a vision. We rushed to the exit of the park as fast as we could. The lady with the hammer chased us to the exit, crawling on our hands and feet. But when we entered the apartment, she just disappeared into thin air. We went home and told our parents, but they did not believe us. Abby and I lost touch after this, but because I was concerned, I told her parents about the incident and how Abby had a nightmare about it too. They didn't believe me at first, but then they saw the terrified look on my face and they understood. They called the cops, and the cops did a thorough investigation in the park and took all of our statements. I was grateful that no one was harmed by the lady. The cops found no sign of the lady. And the worst part is that when the cops checked the camera footage of the park of that night, the woman was not visible. The camera didn't capture her. All the camera showed was my friends and I running as fast as we could after standing still for a moment. The cops then thought that we were just wasting their time and stopped the investigation. I'm 16 now, and my friends and Abby can still swear about what happened that day. We all saw the lady in the white dress. To this day, I am terrified of the incident that happened. Renter Horror Story My name is Samantha, and I'm 16 years old. And today, I'm about to share my one and only, also the creepiest incident of my life. So this is what happened. 
It was Friday night and I was having dinner with my family and we were planning about going somewhere since it was a weekend. After some discussion, we decided to go to my grandma's house, but because of a certain reason, I was not really happy. The reason was obviously not my grandma, but it was our house. So at this point, you must think that it's something about ghosts, but it's not about them. It was just that my grandma was letting someone rent at the top floor of our house, and why? I have no idea. The renter was in his mid-40s or 50s and would repeat clothes thrice a week and always smelled like beer. You see, my grandma is like a really kind person who thinks good for everyone, but however, the renter was not really nice. He would always complain to my grandma about how much me and my brother make noise and that it's not letting them sleep. Like literally he would complain that even when it was daytime and was no sign of sleeping. I told my grandma about how annoying he was, but she would say it would be rude. I wonder why did she let him in at the first place? But I also wanted to see my grandma, so I agreed. The next day we set off to my grandma's house and she was at the gate welcoming us, but unfortunately she wasn't the only one. The renter was standing at his window giving a disgusted look on our family, but I was just so habitual of that look that I just ignored him. Grandma had baked her special muffins for us, and I don't know how, but every single grandma likes to bake stuff. Like, you must have heard this line in every single grandma story. Me and my brother ate them as if they were just one piece in the whole world. After we were done with eating, the elders kept on talking and my brother pulled me outside and told me to play with him. As an older sister, I couldn't deny. So he suggested to play hide and seek and I agreed since I'm also a huge fan of hide and seek. So of course I was elder and I was the sinner. Stupid kid rules. Anyways, I counted till 50 and started searching for my brother. Oh, also, did I mention my brother's name? It is Tim, though. I searched around the bushes in the backyard, but I couldn't find him. Then I searched the entire house, but he wasn't there either. Now I was starting to get worried. And then suddenly a thought popped in my mind. What if he is in the renter's house? I got worried because, as I told you, the relationship of me and the renter is not so good. I thought that I can deal with it alone since I was 16. So I gathered some courage and went upstairs. I don't know why, but I didn't want to ring the doorbell because I didn't want to see the renter. Luckily, the door was open. I stepped in and the first thing I sniffed was beer and something rotten. I didn't feel right, but I had to find my brother. As soon as I took a glance around the room, it was just as I expected it to be. Messy. It hurt to see where it went to after my grandma gave this to the man. I tiptoed towards a room and opened the door and whispered, Tim? Timothy? But there was no response. As soon as I went toward the kitchen, the smell got stronger, and there he was, the renter, sitting on the shelf, looking outside the window. Fortunately, he didn't spot me. To my surprise, I could also see a lady's head sticking out for an unclosed drawer in the kitchen. I let out a short shriek and he suddenly looked back as I stopped looking at him. Then he again started looking at the window. Then I heard my brother screaming my name downstairs. The man suddenly stood up, opened the window and shouted, Shut up you little toddler! Can't you just look for your goddamn sister yourself? I sighed and thought that at least I got relief that my brother is downstairs. I was thinking of going back and telling all of this to mom until my brother screamed back and said, I saw her coming into your house. Can you search for her? As soon as I heard it, I rushed downstairs, grabbed my brother's hand, went into my grandma's house and slammed the door shut and told my parents and grandma everything I saw. They then called the police. After five minutes, we could hear the sirens of the police cars, but as soon as they reached our front door, they started beating someone up and telling the person to surrender. Then my mom opened the door, and there he was, the renter in handcuffs. The cops took him to the car and explained to us how he was standing in front of the front door of my grandma's house ready to murder anyone who'd come out. And about that lady that I saw? She was his ex-wife that he had murdered and the smell of something rotten was coming from her dead body. Thank God I shut the door that day, otherwise me and my family would be dead until now. From that day, my grandma never let anyone rent on the top floor. One day, I was home with my two older brothers. My mom was at work, and she wouldn't be back until 8 p.m. So, as a young girl, I was basically home alone with my older brothers. Keep in mind, I was only 7 years old, and my brothers were 13 and 14. They were also very protective of me at that time. 
Anyway, I remember this incident so vividly, I don't think anything can make me forget about it. And sometimes, I get nightmares because of it. While my brothers and I were eating some cake, the doorbell suddenly rang. Remember, our grandparents and mom told us never to answer the door unless they let us know that someone is coming over. Saying like this, my second brother told us not to get near the door. However, the oldest brother thought he is just a chicken and went to the door. Before he opens it, he then looked out the window and immediately ducked down. He looked like he had just seen a ghost. Second brother took a look outside as well and quickly drew the curtains. What's going on? I asked, but my first brother took a huge freaking knife from the kitchen. Bring me the phone, now. I could even see him grabbing some pepper spray. I gave him the phone and approached the door. As a naive young girl, I ended up opening the door. That's when my second brother carried me and started running. It was just in time. I could see a bullet sliding by my little face. Luckily, it didn't hit me. The three of us rushed to the bedroom. It had two locks on it, and as soon as we locked the door, the sick freak started banging on the door. I burst crying so loud, and he said to me, Don't worry, child. I can help you put her to sleep. My brother yelled, Get the hell out of our house! Then he took his phone from me and called the police and one of our neighbors to get some help. Fortunately, the police immediately arrived and he arrested right in the place. My mom also came back home after she got a phone call from the police. She told us that she would hire a babysitter. It turned out that guy was a serious stalker and a murderer, and he even had killed more than 10 kids. Of course, he was eventually sentenced to death. Several years later, I turned 20 years old, and I was watching the news with my mom and two brothers. There was a murder case that two young boys had been murdered in their house. I know that it's not the same criminal from my case, but it hurts my heart knowing that those kinds of people actually exist out there. I hope they stop doing that horrible thing. I'll start off by saying that I don't live with my family. I'm currently renting a house a half a mile away from them. My mom and my brother live in a subdivision, and my dad is currently working abroad. My brother has a mental disorder, which can make him unpredictable sometimes, and he's still in high school, which also further complicates things. So last year, when my family moved into that house, my mother began experiencing unnatural things. Before she moved in, Mom decided to visit and clean up the house with two of her acquaintances. While they were cleaning, they found these weird red triangle stickers placed above each door. At first, they laughed it off. However, my mother suspected that something wasn't quite right here. When the stickers were removed, she had this inexplicable feeling that they were making a big mistake. The ceiling fans began to turn on and off by themselves. One of my mother's friends was an experienced painter, and he was left alone to paint the walls while my mom went for a food run. She knocked on the door when she got back, but no one answered. She then texted him to let him know that she was back. Suddenly, she received a reply. Just wait. My mom was taken aback by the rude and abrupt message, but she figured that he may have been in the bathroom or something. After a couple of minutes, she knocked on the door again, and her friend eventually opened the door. When it came time to leave, she casually asked her friend if he didn't hear her when she knocked earlier, and mentioned the text message that he had sent. Her friend insisted that he had never sent her a message, and that he couldn't hear her knocking because he had been blasting music on his phone. This gave mom the creeps. The next occurrence happened right after the house was done being remodeled. My mom along with a co-worker of hers arrived at the house, and they couldn't open the door. They both pushed on the door as hard as they could, 
when suddenly there came three knocks from the other side. After they forced the door open, they searched the entire house, but no one was there. We found out from some of the neighbors that the family who lived there before didn't stay there for very long because of a series of bizarre and inexplicable occurrences. After my mom and brother moved in, the supernatural events worsened. There have been numerous attempts to deal with the restless spirits in the house, even inviting some local pastors over to bless the home. I was and still am worried about my wayward brother. Whatever resides in that house has seemed to take a special interest in him. He can hear his name being called out, beckoning to him. This is still an ongoing occurrence. I'll list some of the other things that they have been experiencing. Household items are moved around. Faucets are turned on. Lights flicker uncontrollably. Random knocking can be heard on the roof and scratch marks have appeared on the walls. My mother has reached her breaking point and plans on moving out of that hell house. I just hope it's not too late for them. Their departure may trigger whatever is targeting my brother. It might just stop toying with him and make its move. Running into a cat man. Have you ever seen a cat man before? Literally, a cat man. A man in a cat's body. It's a horrible hybrid. A mutant? Or maybe it's born with gene manipulation? Or has it always existed? I cannot forget the day that I faced that monster. I was driving on a highway, and suddenly, a giant leopard-like animal jumped onto the road. Surprised, I slammed on my brakes, and the cat turned sideways while I was trying to avoid it. I crashed into the guardrail and got hurt. The thing I saw on the road that day still gives me chills. It had a cat's body, but the face was that of a man. At a glance, it looked like a leopard because it was pretty big, but I clearly saw its face was a human. It gave me a quick look and turned around to disappear into the woods. I nearly passed out from the shock of the accident, plus the shock from the monster. In the end, I was taken to a hospital for medical attention. Fortunately, I didn't get any serious injuries, but the car was wrecked. Right, I thought, the black box. I watched the black box video, but the clip didn't show the monster's face in detail making it look like a leopard animal. Everyone who watched the video would say it's just an animal and didn't believe me. But I'm suffering from terrible nightmares after that day. It's absolutely horrible to see that monster with a man's face. I still can't forget the eyes to this day. What do you think it was? I time traveled into the future and the earth had come to an end. I'm not sure how I went and came back from the future. I think it might have been a sort of warping of space-time. Three years ago, I was hiking with my dad on a mountain that we had never visited before. My family lived in the countryside and the mountain was desolate. Even though it was near our place, we never climbed that particular mountain. We would normally drive out to famous mountains with more visitors. We considered the mountain dangerous because there are no climbers in such a remote mountain with a high chance of getting lost. We could run into wild animals like boars in the mountains if we were unlucky. But that day, weirdly enough, my dad suggested climbing that remote mountain. I went without worry since I was with my dad. The mountain was steeper and harder to climb than we thought, so we climbed uphill with ragged breath. However, we couldn't reach the top no matter how hard we climbed, and the sun was about to set. I asked my dad to go down, and he agreed. But we couldn't reach the road even after a long downhill. 
It felt like we were going around the same spot as if we were lost. The sun was continuing to set and I grew anxious. Dad also couldn't hide his anxiety. We were walking for a while like that and suddenly we heard a loud bang as if the sky was falling apart. I screamed, frightened. The ground was shaking up and down like crazy. In that unbelievable situation, I fell into extreme fear. My dad was also in a panic. And then I couldn't see anything, as if the entire world was in a blackout. There was the sun until just now, but I couldn't see anything as if we were in a completely dark cave. It was pitch darkness that I couldn't even see an inch in front of me. I looked at my dad yelling and fumbled for my dad's hands. I could feel from his hands that my dad was also shaking. The darkness continued for a while, and suddenly it turned bright. Then the scenery in front of me was the devastated earth. We were indeed in the middle of the mountain until just now, but we couldn't see a single tree around us anymore. There was an endless barren land like a desert in front of us. I looked toward where our village should be, but it was full of destroyed houses and buildings. A chill of fear ran through me. Did the world come to an end? I looked at my dad, and he was also overwhelmed with fear. We climbed down the mountain without trees and continued to roam around, but there was no single human alive, only full of destroyed buildings. Weirdly, those buildings were not the ones that existed in our neighborhood. They had peculiar shapes, the shapes that I had never seen before. But one thing was for sure is that they were all broken down. Unfamiliar vehicles that were similar, cars were scattered across the streets, broken. I was completely baffled. What is all this? Have we traveled to a different space? Dad and I got so scared and decided to head in the direction where there used to be a big city. We thought there might be someone there. Trusting our instinct with the direction, we walked about three hours north and finally reached the place that looked like the big city. There was indeed a big city, but also completely destroyed. It consisted of components that I had never seen before. At that moment, we could hear someone's voice. My dad grabbed me to hide. A strange man voiced asked, Shalishma? Mashuka Tobare? Another voice answered. We couldn't understand them. It sounded like a foreign language, but I swear to God that I've never heard that language before. When I took a peek, they were holding strange weapons that looked like guns. They manipulated their weapons, then the guns started to ring an alarm as if they figured out our location. Then the strange people looked in our direction. They ran toward us and said, Vishkauchi Piker! We weren't sure how to respond. I spoke in English, but they couldn't understand. Then they started to hit me. My dad got angry and tried to fight them off, but he couldn't easily do that because of their weapons. They hit me with their sticks looking like a police baton and my skin started to burn with great pain as if touching boiling water. I started to scream. Then my dad gave a blow to the strange man's face. They all pointed their guns at my dad. I thought, we're all gonna die, shutting my eyes tight. At that moment, the world started to shake with another loud bang. The ground started to wiggle up and down. The people in front of us suddenly vanished. Then the pitch darkness fell upon us again. The world went bright after a while, and we were back again to our world once again. We were standing in the middle of our city, our earth. The sun was up in the sky and everything was peaceful. The cars were driving down the road and people were walking around. Dad and I didn't say a word while riding a bus back home. The world we looked out out of the bus window was unchanged. The destroyed world we saw just now was no more. Once we arrived home, my dad and I looked at each other's eyes, but couldn't say anything. We couldn't understand what was happening and how to explain all of it. 
we were both in panic. When we gathered ourselves, I could feel pain in my arm. The parts that were hit by the sticks were burnt red. Dad and I went to see a doctor, but we could only describe it as a burn from something hot. We knew that they wouldn't believe us even if we told them the truth. Since that day, my dad and I didn't talk about what happened that day. I think we couldn't accept what happened ourselves. We never went back to that mountain again. Three years have passed and we live as if nothing has happened. But after that day, I've always questioned myself. What was that? Have I visited the future? Or was it a different dimension? What was that city? The people? The answers to the questions are still unfound. And the truth still is a mystery. I grew up in this podunk town in Nebraska, and in the 18 years I lived there, only two significant things happened. The first thing, and probably the best thing, is that I was born. I know, you're all very welcome. But the second, and perhaps the worst thing that ever happened in our town, was when Kevin Meyer set his garage on fire. Or rather, maybe what Kevin did constituted the worst thing that never happened to our town, and if that doesn't make any sense, bear with me. All would become clear over the course of the next few paragraphs. So it was a Sunday night and I was in my freshman year of high school at the time, so still at that age when me and my friends would go out on our bikes for an evening. You know, good old wholesome fun. We're just riding around when we see another kid from our class riding down the street at top speed. We stop to say hey and in between panting breaths the kid's like, oh my god guys, the Myers garage is on fire, come look. We then hurtled down the street at full speed, following the kid from our class until we're faced with this raging inferno that used to be the Myers family garage. Only, right as we get there, we're immediately told to keep back by the cops and firefighters on scene. We thought we were already at a safe distance, so we're kind of confused but did as we're told. Only then we start hearing all these pops and bangs coming from the garage, and the firefighters trying to put the flames out suddenly ran for cover. I had no idea what was causing the little bangs, but if it was scaring the cops and the firefighters, then I figured I should have been scared of it too. I actually thought the Meyer house was about to explode or something, and so did my buddies, so we had no problem getting out of there quick, riding home and telling our parents about it. The next morning at school, all the kids were talking about the fire, mainly because Kevin Meyer hadn't showed up to any of his classes. Some kids were spreading rumors saying they'd seen the paramedics loading him up onto an ambulance and he was so badly burned that he was just a smoldering husk. Others said that he and his parents had gone to live with relatives since the fire had made their house basically unlivable, which is the story I believe because I figured there'd be actual confirmation if anyone had died. But then the next morning, there was confirmation. News reports said that firefighters had recovered one body from the burned out garage while the surviving family members were staying with relatives and had asked the media to give them some space. So, on that Tuesday we knew someone had died, but we had no idea exactly who. The Myers had three generations living in that house and Kevin was one of four kids. A bunch more rumors began swirling and it was only the following day when our high school principal called us all in for a special assembly that we actually got any concrete answers. I remember the whole school filing into the gymnasium where the county sheriff and a handful of deputies were all stood in front of the bleachers, each of them with a real serious look on their faces. Once we were all seated, the principal opened up by saying that the county sheriff had something important to talk to us about, and as he stepped forward and took his hat off, I swear you could have heard a pin drop. We knew it was going to be something about the Meyer family, but exactly what it was, I'd swear I'd never have guessed in a million years. I'm not about to pretend I can remember what the guy said word for word. This all happened almost 20 years ago now, but this is basically the gist of it. Folks, you've all heard about the fire over at the Meyer place, and 
I'm sure you've all heard about the tragic loss of life. Well, I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you, but your classmate Kevin was the one who passed. There was a kind of rolling gasp across the gym, and the sheriff paused for a second before continuing. Now, we're still trying to figure out how the fire started, so we're inviting anyone with any information on Kevin to please step forward. You don't have to do it now. You can call my office whenever you like, and we can have a more discreet conversation. But please, if you have anything to tell us about any strange or unusual behavior Kevin exhibited in the days before the fire, I implore you to step forward. That was the first clue we had that something was really wrong. I guess they wanted to handle the whole thing with kid gloves, and I can totally understand why they might want to shield us from what they already knew. The initial reaction was one of total shock and grief. Kids were horrified that one of their own had died in such a horrible way. But if the cops had told us what they'd really found in there, I don't think people would have been nearly as sad. More like, angry. It took two more days for the truth to come out, and by that time, the town had decided to defer responsibility to our parents. There was a town meeting, I remember that, because my parents asked me to do my chores before they returned, and all I did was play Perfect Dark for like two hours. When they got home, I thought they'd be mad that I hadn't even put a dent into any of the stuff I had to do, but they weren't mad. They had these weird but sad, but intense looks on their faces, exactly the same ones they had when my grandpa died suddenly. They sit me down in the TV room and ask how well I knew Kevin. I tell them not much that I had Spanish class with him, but that we never talked. They then start asking me a bunch of other questions if Kevin ever got mad at me, if I liked him, stuff like that. In the end, I just straight up told them it was obvious they knew something about Kevin and that I'd rather they just told me that it was him taking his own life or something because I was old enough to handle the truth. Turns out, I was not old enough to handle the truth. Kevin hadn't taken his own life. He'd accidentally blown himself up trying to make a bomb. Apparently, he wanted to test his method out by making a test model. But as he was putting it together, he somehow detonated the thing and made it enough of a bang to kill him before setting his garage on fire. At first, it had looked like he might have just been a firebug, you know, like a pyromaniac, and he was just screwing around with an accelerant or something. That's why it took a few days for the cops to be sure of what happened. They had to go over the burned out garage and go through Kevin's stuff to try and work out why he did it. The cops then found a journal Kevin had been keeping, one where he'd basically laid out his plan to build a bomb then put it under the church one Sunday morning while it was full of families. The cops wouldn't say exactly what the rest of the journal consisted of, only that it made for highly disturbing reading and that there were several references to the Columbine massacre of the year before. Mom was crying by the end of the talk and Dad was the most shaken up I'd ever seen him. That kid wanted to kill almost the entire town and... Let me tell you, if he'd hit the church around the upcoming Veterans Day service, he'd have killed like 90% of the people in our town, all in one fiery blast. And the most I ever got for an explanation was just, the kid wanted to hurt people, or he wasn't right. No one really bullied the kid or gave him a hard time, he was just crazy, I guess. But I also thank God that he wasn't smarter and that he didn't, like, put a little more research in or take a little more care. Because if he had, he might have wiped our entire town right off the map. 